If we look at silver, the interesting thing about silver compared to gold and copper is when you think about the periodic table, I've always considered silver to be trapped in that table. It's trapped between copper on one end member, we know there are lots of primary copper deposits, and it's trapped between gold on the bottom, there's lots of primary gold deposits. And then it's got these cousins on the side, lead and zinc, and it tends to go with them. Very few primary silver projects, very different than gold, um, you know, in, in the companies that John would be talking about. So if we look at silver, last year of the uh, 710 million ounces produced, 214 million ounces of that came from primary mines. These are in Mexico, Peru, and Australia, and other countries. And then if we look at gold, 87 million ounces of silver, about 12%, came as byproduct of gold mines. For 241, lead zinc, so there's actually more silver comes from lead zinc mines than actually come from primary silver mines. And of course we have the copper mines at uh, 166 million ounces. What that means, particularly in the last bull market of, pressure, of both base metals, is the fact that a lot of silver has come into the marketplace, not as a function of silver price, but as a function of other prices. And that's one thing that can have a, a negative effect on silver, because if you're a gold miner and a lead zinc miner, you don't care what price silver is. You'll sell it at any price going forward. So that's, again, one of those aspects of the complexity about this metal. Now, historical. Silver's been mined for 7,000 odd years, if you go way back to biblical times. And during that time period, it's estimated about 1.37 million tons versus 150,000 tons of gold has been mined. So that's an order of magnitude of 10. Now what's that work out to? That's about 40 billion ounces worth about five, 40 billion ounces of silver with about five uh, billion ounces of gold. To put that in perspective, all the gold mined in the world would fit in a cube 62 feet square. To put it into perspective here, as I'm a geologist, I actually mapped this room out last night. If you took the wall down with a map room, all the gold ever known in mankind would fit in this room from a cubic volume point of view. It's about 20 feet tall if you measure in the sides. Interesting point. All the silver mine in the world would then be 10 of these, topped up high. But the interesting thing about silver, so much of that is consumed and taken away um, that it's just not available to come back and recycled. So yesterday you heard the figure about a billion ounces uh, talked about between the ETFs uh, and Eric Sprott's fund uh, and uh, the personal net worth. If you had a billion ounces of silver which is identifiable, that will all fit in the map room. If you put it all together, it would fit in there. And I can talk a little about that from some experience because a few years ago, those of you who are silver standard cheerleaders, we went out and bought two million ounces of silver. We stored it in a bank vault and I would go every year to visit it to make sure all the bars were there, as tarnished as they were, and some of them were bunker hunt bars and some of them were newer bars. But I can tell from that bank and where we stored two million ounces of silver, it doesn't take up a lot of room. But it takes a lot of more room than, it, uh, than gold and I mean that's one of the, uh, the issues I'll talk a little bit uh, about that as well. One thing, the silver-gold ratio, people always bring it up and talk about it. Um, historically, in Roman times, it was set at 13 to 1. Why is that? Because silver represented Mars, which was the moon. The moon went around the sun, around the uh, constellations, at 13 to 1. Right? It takes 13 turns of the moon around, and so therefore, Apollo being the sun and gold, the ratio was set at 13 to 1. 13 to 1 was a bit difficult. They knocked it back to 12 to 1. During the uh, Middle Ages, it went to 14 to 1 then got as high as kind of 16 to 1 at the turn of the last century, 20 to 1. And of course now we've seen it with, uh, with the trading going on. Uh, it's quite variable. The only one key point I think Eric Sprott mentioned yesterday, it's from the geological survey, is the crustal abundance of silver to gold is 17 to 1. In, uh, in just finishing up, um, there was some commentary yesterday about a dollar. And, and I have a dollar here. And you probably all have dollars in your wallet. It says one dollar on the bottom of it. But being a uh, silver bull, of course, many of you know, what is a dollar? If you go back to the Currency Act of April the 2nd, 1792, a dollar is actually defined as 371.25 grains of silver, or 8.4 ounces, which would make this dollar worth about $18.50. I'm not sure that's the case of it. But that is what a dollar is actually defined as. Um, it's obvious that other people are using ink to define something else. So drivers for silver. Um, as I said, I'm a major investor in this commodity and have been from uh, getting involved with it as a result of um, uh, Rick and Jim Blanchard and, and Doug 17 years ago. A couple things then to take away. Mine supply does not meet demand. We've seen that. And many of the new applications which are coming out 
silver's not recycled, so it's not going to come back into the supply the scraps chain. And right now we need about 20% of annual consumption has to come from scrap. So as that goes down, we're going to have to go out and find new mines or new sources for that silver to come up, and that can only speak to higher prices. We're finding at mines that the cost of mining continues to go up, the cost of discovery continues to go up. And so I think that's the only place that we can find that plugged. You know, some people comment about the fact that you have a lot of silverware out there, Catholic Church, a case in point, if you look at all the silver which is within it. But a lot of that's historic emotional. It's not coming back into the marketplace. It's very price insensitive. It's just not going to come back. Right now, we've got government regulations on a global basis. I mean, governments are looking for new areas to tax us, as been the theme throughout here, looking at taxing mining companies. And as a result, we need higher prices to be able to deal with the new taxation regimes that governments are going to put on. I say the cash costs continue to increase. Uh, for existing mines, they've often high-graded or taken the best ore when we had these lower prices, so they have to be looking further afield from their processing facilities. Again, we need higher prices for that. Scrap supply, as I point out, is declining because photographic scrap is not as available to us as it is. Some coinage isn't. Back in 1980, 1979 and 80, when we had the run-up with the Hunt brothers cornering the market and silver went from uh, $3 up to $50, during that time period, scrap was about 120 million ounces. When silver hit 50 bucks an ounce, scrap recycling went up to about 180 million ounces and then dropped off the following year to 130. We had a 15-fold increase in the price and a 50% of scrap came into the marketplace. And I think you'll see the same thing here. People often say, well, if the price moves up, there'll be a lot of scrap coming in. As I pointed out, I don't think the infrastructure's there in order to do it. And two, a lot of that scrap just isn't available anymore. I'm not sure how many people here, I mean, last night in the banquet, it was great to see silver being used in there, but the only silver where I have at home happens to be my grandmother's silver, and it's not available to the marketplace at kind of any price. And so I think going forward, um, scrap supply is and continues to be fine. Infrastructure forward is not well established. Uh, if you have scrap, where do you go to take it to bring it back? Um, uh, recent changes, uh, you know, increases, uh, let's say, in, in coinage purposes, have, purchases have been done at higher prices, so I don't see them being available to the scrap market. Another aspect that's interesting is uh, my role in the Silver Institute traveled a lot in the Far East. Silver is uh, compliant under Sharia law. In $140 oil, we saw a lot of money being transferred from here over to the Mideast, and they look for places to invest in it. And many over there are also very silver or bullish because it does comply with their law, and so there's another possible avenue for uh, further consumption going for it. Um, when we look at some of the drivers which are, aren't so positive, one is the fact, the theme before, that mine supply uh, is largely byproduct. Most of the silver comes from other mines, and so it's going to be somewhat held captive to the prices of those mines and how much um, uh, byproduct is brought on. Having said that, you can have very large gold mines and very large lead zinc mines which produce only incremental small amounts of, um, of silver. Cannington would be the case, uh, the exception to that. So there often isn't a lot of silver which comes into it. Um, one thing about silver, of course, as we know, it's not quite as portable as gold. I have certainly physical silver, as well as I own physical, uh, physical gold. The costs are higher on that, and I think it's one reason is we think that because of its volatility, there actually may be better return coming from silver than we would see from gold, because we do have the higher storage uh, costs which come around it. So, after 17 years, um, I have, I hope I've been able to give you a bit of a better understanding of what's going on in the silver market currently. It did suffer last year because of its industrial applications, but I think with this renewed investor interest, which we see here, particularly amongst yourselves, um, as the uh, general marketplace out there continues to invest in silver, I think because of its constraints of supply, the lack of supply, let's say, in mean mining companies, that silver is probably still has a good way to go, and that's why I continue to stay well invested in it. And it's really uh, good for me to be back here with uh, amongst friends, and I thank you for the opportunity to listen today and present.